on, you know. Um, all sorts of things you, 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 you didn't like about being in a foxhole, you know, if you were claustrophobic at all, it was... <laughs> And then you, 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 we always, if you could, you would dig a little bit sideways so that you, you, um, a tree burst might not get you in the head or the face or whatever. Um, uh, and so you couldn't be claustrophobic in those things. And of course they were damp and dank and, you know, it didn't bother you. And then we had these K rations that we ate. Um, uh, it's a good thing that you're young. You know, war is a young man's game. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but anyway, you started to ask me about uh, my perception of the war as I went on. Well, I started to say that that the day before our very first uh, combat experience, it was a combination of... Uh, some introspection, some wonderment at what it's going to be like, uh, some, I can't wait for it to start because we've been training so long and we're over there and been on these patrols. Um, some worry about home and maybe not making it or whatever. Uh, that's what I meant by introspection. But on balance, ready to go, okay? Then, as I said, the, f the first moment you're in it and uh, everything's going off and uh, people are wounded, the medics are, uh, people are calling for medics and uh, the, the artillery coming in, the machine guns, uh, whatever, you know, all the noise and so on and so forth. Suddenly, the reality sets in that, boy, this is, this is for real. This is, this, is, this is serious stuff, you know. And as I said, uh, we always never had a moment's hesitation to do what we're supposed to do. Um, and, and during the fighting, you tended not to, to feel this sort of mental strain of every day, uh, people being wounded and killed and so on and so forth. But then you'd stop in the evening or night, or that particular battle will be over, and you got to. And now you begin, you, 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 the thing begins to settle in, and that's why I say there's no atheists in foxholes at that point. And the more you're there, the longer you're there, um, the more you know your chances of survival are. Now, some infantry units, uh, as I understand it, uh, had a, not the tenth, now I'm talking about some of the divisions that fought up through Salerno and through taking Rome and so on and so forth, they had almost 100% replacement. So even though it was 100% replacement, some guys made it from the very beginning to the end. It's just the, the numbers of people that were turned over. But we had a huge turnover, uh, not as much as some of them because we were only in combat. I don't know how many fighting days we had, but I'm guessing the actual fighting combat days were and I'll just use a loose term now, maybe 60 days, 65 days, something like that. Um, imagine if you were there a year. One of the things I would recommend to the military is, you, you know, the, the bombers used to fly 50 missions, you went back home. I mean, maybe if you had 50 days in combat, you ought to be relieved, you know, because that way it, it, morale would be considerably improved. Because you know if you're there, you're there, you're there, you're there for a year, you probably aren't going to make it, you know. So this is that sort of mental strain. Well, anyway, the more it goes on, the more that sort of builds. You still do your job, you still do everything, but um, as, as, it was almost like we couldn't wait the first, before the first time. And then as time went on, you know, you were hoping it was going to end, you know. So it, it changed, you know. When you think about the group of guys you met in there and that you're still close to today, I mean, are you impressed by how such a relatively short period of time could make such a big impact on people? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, war is a, you know, it makes, it's a tremendous impact. And, of course, you know, you know how it affected some people's lives because, A, they were wounded very badly or were killed or 
and then the people that survived, uh, they, they were different people afterwards. I think in most cases they were better people as a result. I think they had a better perspective of, of war and, and how it affected. One of the things, I'm digressing a bit, but one of the things that made me very happy on this trip was I had this vision, and you can see it in the pictures that are in the Denver Library, wherever they are, or the 87th book, of what those hillsides looked like and what those towns looked like, what Castellano looked like. It was rubble. And now I go back and I see this very pretty, beautiful countryside and beautiful homes and, and, and relative affluence. You know, that was a very positive feeling in the sense that, uh, well, we had something to do with making all of this possible, you know. Um, so uh, I, that was a good feeling, seeing Does it all. Does feel like the same place? No, no. In one sense, no. On the other hand, climbing up Belvedere, eh, that was the same place, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's the same place, but it's not, I don't, I don't know. That's a tough question. It's not the same place because I was so pleased to see I mean, the, everything was so orderly. The fields were so nicely uh, cultivated, and, and every, the barns and everything were neat. And when we were there, it was I mean, you got to remember it was absolute chaos, and those poor families, you know, um, you know, a lot of the villages, the people had fled; they had gone somewhere else. But in some, they were still there. And as we came through and we were fighting, they were in the basements. They were, you know, wherever they could, down with the animals. The animals were usually in the lower, because this is largely a mountainous uh, agricultural kind of uh, community. And they had, uh, you know, uh, various kinds of animals underneath. In those days, I guess, the heat of the animals helped heat the houses. I don't know. Because uh, that's why they put them there. Uh, <laughs> and and, and, and to, to see it now is just, it was just, it's just the contrast. And I guess I was a little naive. I was hoping to go back and see that area at Pietroclora where we used to come back. It was kind of our little Taj Mahal that we went back to. When you think about it, that couldn't be the same as when we were there. I mean, it, probably, probably they knocked all that stuff down and built something new, you know. I was a little naive about that, but um, I'll tell you, the Po River was very real. It was the same. That was the one spot that was very, very much the same. And what was it like when you crossed it the first time? Well, I mentioned earlier, I think, that, that uh, they really pounded us on the south bank of the river where we were waiting uh, to, uh, first of all, for the, the boats, the rubber rafts to come up. And uh, I can't remember, but it seemed, it certainly it was several hours that we were there. We were pounded pretty heavily. Now, as I recall, going across in the, in the rubber rats, the only thing I remember is small arms fire and not a whole lot of it. Um, and I must say that, that some people's memory gets a little exaggerated over time because while I won't mention the outfit, but it wasn't the 87th and they talked about crossing. Well, they crossed the day after we did, but that north bank was all cleared by that time. And they were talking about geysers of water going in the air and the shells hitting the water. So I think that must have been some Private Ryan stuff they saw or something. But... Um, I shouldn't be too glib about that, but clearly the 10th, I mean, the, the first platoon, the 87th, was the first to cross. I don't think our company or my squad was the first to cross. Uh, but I do remember being in those boats and wanting to paddle like hell to get to the other side as quickly as possible. And I do remember small arms fire. Now, a small arms fire could easily have taken out a boat. What, you know, oh, sure. To sunk the boat, did that occur yeah. at all? Could that occur? Did, did it occur? Uh, didn't, to our boat, I, I, I heard stories that uh, some boats were, were taken out, but 
um, the resistance was a lot less than we expected. I think, I think they, the, the Germans must have decided to not set up uh, you know, a defensive line in the, the flatland of the Po Valley. They were going to they were going to slow us down as much as possible, take as many lives and give a, and, and, and inflict as many uh, wounded soldiers as possible, but and force us to delay while they got their their uh, their defenses set up in the in the Alps, up in that Lago de Garda area. Um, uh, so uh, again, I think they did as much damage as they could uh, with the artillery fire because the artillery and the mortars came in from, uh, you know, somewhere in back of the north bank of the river, somewhere north of that. Uh, but uh, they had limited number of people uh, defending the bank itself, the north bank. Did that bank look the same as it looked? That's what uh, you know. It, it, the, the curve in the river and the trees at one corner. And I said to myself, we, because the, the bridge had either been blown by the Germans that was there or we had bombed it out to slow down their uh, retreat. I don't know which. But right at where we had lunch at San Benedetto, did you see those little, there was a new bridge going across, but there was the old abutments of an old bridge. We were south of that. And, and uh, that was kind of fun to see that part of the river where we crossed. We crossed south of that, maybe 400, 500 yards south of there. Um, so it's not significantly so different. No, no, it's not significantly different at all. Maybe that restaurant is the one. That's all new, I guess, but... Uh, the, the river itself, when you think about it, the, that bend in that river isn't going to change that much in that big sandbar that was out there. How about like those sort of dikes or, you know, the way the shoreline looks? Is that yeah, awesome? the, 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 the stone dikes were not there at the time, but they had berms hmm. there. I guess it was mostly uh, earthen berms that were there. Um, and that's why when south of the river, we were south of a berm, and the small arms fire couldn't touch us. They had to have mortars and artillery come in to get us, get at us. They didn't have much height, did they? No, no. I mean, that's what I looked at and I thought, oh, this can't be the same, because they had no height. I mean, they didn't have much. What do you mean? I'm, I'm, well, they didn't have much to... Shoot, shoot at us? Yeah, well, they didn't have much of a point of view. Would to they? see us. Right. Oh, no. That's right. why they had to use... It wasn't that we, we experienced small arms fire when we started crossing. Now they could see us. Now they have a line of sight. Mm -hmm. But when we were on the south end, it was all artillery and mortars. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty heavy, pretty heavy. Did you just dig in right where you were? I was in a shell hole. I, I didn't have to dig in. I went into a shell hole. That's convenient. But I told you about the, the guy I was in there with. There were two of us in there. <laughs> Digging for the China, right? right. <laughs> but I, it was fun seeing that, and then because I was you know, the reason I went is I wanted to see you know where we had fought and so on, and um, what it would look like now and so on. Did you have any sense when you guys were getting ready to cross the road that you were way out in front of everybody else? Yeah, we had a feeling at that time. We. we you know, as I say, you're as a as a as a small cog in a huge, huge, huge wheel. Uh, I didn't know, and I don't know to this day whether uh, our platoon went across first or not. Uh, and I was surprised that the, the the fire that we took wasn't a lot heavier. I thought it would have been a lot heavier, and boy, we were quite anxious to get across quickly because you're vulnerable on that river, you know. Uh, you're why you're just exposed, and um, uh, and yes, there was small arms fire, but I don't remember any artillery shells hitting the water, or I don't think they were aimed there. I think they were aimed on the south bank where we were uh, sort of getting ready to come across, which makes sense, you know. Um, my guess is is that our squad certainly wasn't the first across. 
And these were 12 man boats and there were, uh, there was somebody that knew how to take those boats across. And I think they were manned by somebody from engineering battalion or something, you know. Did uh, you, did you oar or row? Or? I think some of us had to row. I don't recall myself rowing, uh, but uh, it would have been chaos to have uh, eight or ten guys rowing. It'd be all over one another. So I think there were like four or six paddlers. Uh, it wasn't a row. It was a, a, a paddles, as I remember. Uh, but uh, we were moving so fast at that time. I think we were kind of, on the one hand, when is this thing going to end? Every day there was some more... Like Emory was killed in the Po Valley. Uh, Emory was wounded in the Po Valley. Uh, so people were still being killed and still being wounded. Yeah, but on the other hand, we had a sense, I think we all had a sense, we were out of those bloody mountains where you had, every time you had to fight uphill, you know? And that was kind of uh, very helpful to, to our morale. And you know, you talk about incidents. I remember at night walking Two columns, one on each side of a, not a major road, but a paved road going north. And what must have been a German tank wheeled and fired right down that road, <laughs> right between the two columns. Ed remembers that too. Uh, you know, this is something you'd never forget, you know. Um, the, 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 the noise and the speed of that damn, those damn shells going through there. Um, but there was a certain sense that maybe we, maybe we were going to, maybe this thing was going to end because we were moving so fast, you know. Then, of course, when we got to the mountains on the other side, you know. <laughs> How did you feel when you got to those mountains? Were you uh, mountains? No, not really. No, no. And I never realized how beautiful it was until I went on this trip. I mean, you just don't, it doesn't, that doesn't sink in at that point. You, you know, as, as I think everybody will tell you that your war is right here and it's objective and survival in it because uh, you can't be very effective if you don't survive and and uh, and, you, and you clearly want to take your objective and get your objective done i remember very clearly uh, going up uh, to spiazzi and uh, our squad, if not our platoon, came around from the back of the town while uh, I think Company A was coming at the front of the town. And um, You were circumventing the tunnels, right? Uh, no. See, you got Lago de Garda and the tunnels. You know, the door is Lago de Garda, okay? This is the east bank over here, this okay. door. The, the door jam on the right-hand side is the east bank. Okay. Mussolini's villa is over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, the end of the lake where we stayed is up here. Right. And all the tunnels were here. And there's a huge mountain uh, spine here. Uh, we got to maybe the first tunnel and our, our uh, our company and the 87th moved over this mountain range into this and came up here to out so that we, there wasn't a flank. And the Spiazzi's up in here, over this mountain range. You couldn't see the lake from Spiazzi. Here. And this, the goal of this maneuver, I'm going to put you back down. Okay. Oh, did and, it fall? I uh, just clipped it. And the goal of your maneuver up to Spiazzi. Well, I can't see it, so you'll have to do it. This was the alternative to the people taking the ducks, right? Yeah, well, no, I think what they wanted us to do was protect our flanks. In other words, we were very vulnerable going up here along the lake. What's over here where they could, right. you know, cut they, back, could be in behind us and so on. So that was it. But Spiazzi was... They didn't send many people on that, did they? Was it a lot? Well, I think they sent uh, our... Uh, uh, the 87th up in, in that, 87th was their mission, they went up there. 
And uh, as I said, Company A approached Spiazzi from the front of the town, and we came in in the back, Company C, and I remember very clearly the firefight there. And um, you talk about instincts. Um, I remember there were you know cultivated fields as we approached from from the rear, and. Um, uh, a rifle grenade that they would shoot from the end of a rifle would, rather than throwing a potato masher, they could send this uh, grenade off the end of a, a rifle. It would carry a little further, but you could see it. It was relatively slow motion, relatively speaking. And I could see from its trajectory that so it was going to land very close to me. This is you talk about instincts. And I quickly uh, half jumped, half rolled half about six or seven yards away to the right and the thing just landed very close there and it just missed me. But I remember that incident and then a little few minutes later we, a German machine gunner who had been shooting at us uh, put up the white flag and uh, we took him prisoner and um, I, I got a stiletto from him, which I still have, and a Luger, which was a prized pistol that uh, not many, the inf general infantry didn't have a Luger, it was just the machine gunners or certainly the officers had Lugers. And I brought that home as a souvenir and my, I'm sure my mother just threw it away because she didn't want that kind of stuff in the house. So. <laughs> uh, she never admitted to that, but uh, you know, it just disappeared off into the... You know, so I'm sure that uh, that's what happened. Was there ever a time when you thought you wouldn't make it home? No. I think one of the things that keep you going is... Well, uh, it's not going to be me. I mean, it's not to the point where you you aren't concerned about it, but I think if you knew you were going to be killed in the next three minutes, I don't think you'd go there, would you? I mean, if you absolutely were certain. But, so there's always the thought that you're going to be all right. And at times you're sweating it pretty, I mean, you, you just don't get up and run around and say, well, I'm not going to get killed, you know. Uh, but you know, if, if you took away the, the idea that uh, nobody's going to make it at all, I don't think that you would get the commitment to battle. You see what I mean? So I think uh, we always had the feeling that, you know, and the more, of course, the longer you were there, you had the feeling that, you know, if the longer this goes on, you know, my luck isn't going to hold, you know. But uh, you always, you know, you know, you always had that hope that you were going to make it. I, I never had a feeling that, you know, bingo, today's the day or anything like that. I don't think anybody had that feeling that today's the day. And it happens, it all happens so quickly. The only time I was uh, hit was with a piece of spent shrapnel. And um, it, was, it came down from pretty high somewhere. And it obviously had, and then it was winding down. It was making this awful noise. And uh, hit me somewhere on my body. It didn't wound me or anything. I didn't get. Uh, but I can remember uh, thinking that here's a piece of shrapnel that found me, and that's the way it found the people that were killed or wounded. I mean, it's just sheer luck. But this was a piece of spent shrapnel. I mean, it was pretty heavy when it hit me, and I, I think it tore into my clothes and so on, but I didn't get a wound that I bled from. And I can't even, can't even remember where it hit me now, you know. But I was. At the time, I was hunkering down because there was a tremendous amount of artillery coming in. And it was the beginning of the spring offensive. And shortly after, I, I had this experience with this German chap that I mentioned to you. Uh, in many instances, war is very personal in terms of the enemy. In most instances, it's not. It's, it's superior firepower and movement that overcomes the enemy, and you don't even make contact with them. Now, in some cases you do, like I did with this machine gunner. 
Uh, and of course, we took prisoners and so on and so forth. But the bulk of the, the Germans would retreat at some point, like they've had it, you know. Um, maybe that was more so at the end of the war than it was, you know, in North Africa. I don't know. But the thing that wins wars is uh, a combination of, of the value system, the commitment, the superior uh, firepower, uh, the superior technology, and the superior numbers. Um, because you can have all the commitment in the world if you've only got 10 guys against, uh, just to make it ridiculous, a thousand, you're not gonna make it, you know. So it's a combination of, of all those things and importantly, more importantly, is uh, keeping the soldiers fresh and supplied and, and fed and uh, as much rest as you can get them. Although we didn't get much when we headed out across the Po. <clears throat> um, the Germans didn't, uh, you know, they, they, they must have felt, and I've often thought about this, I mean, they, they had the better artillery. The 88 was a much better gun than any guns that we had, uh, any, any artillery that we had. And in fact, their, their best tank was better than ours. But we had air power, air superiority. And that was a great advantage, you know. We could call in... Uh, uh, we didn't, but the, the officers called in the, the, artil the, uh, the air power, which helped us a lot. It didn't help us on Belvedere because it was at night, but it did help quell some counterattacks on Belvedere. And while we were um, occupying Belvedere, uh, we knew there would be a counterattack, which there was, but it was considerably uh, ameliorated, considerably softened by our air power. And uh, the poor guys that had the counterattack, I mean, they must have known they were in trouble. And uh, quite a, quite a, there was quite a pressure right on our front uh, the, the uh, morning after the taking of Belvedere. And uh, quite a few Germans were killed there. You never felt good about seeing a, a dead soldier, even if he was German. You know, you don't, you didn't say, yippee, I didn't ever, you know, dead soldier is a little somber, you know. Um, and then some of them were quite young. Some of them were younger than we were. You know, I was 20 in combat by the time we went through training and so on. I joined the, 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 the 10th when I was 18 maybe July, August, September, October, five months before my 19th birthday. Then we trained, so on and so forth. And so when I was in combat, it was, I was uh, 20 years, my first combat was February, 20 years and three months. So there's some people on the German side that are a lot younger than us. I don't know how young, but um, I don't know who, who uh, who was advising Hitler, but, you know, to have all those fronts. Well, somebody said in the book, uh, The Last Ridge, that, uh, that, well, the Germans felt they were occupying, you know, so many divisions of ours. What we, we had, the, the Allied powers had so many more divisions, you know, and here they had this other front. And then the mistake of opening the Russian front, you know, my God, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, you had to, had to respect them for their, their technology and what they were able to do um, as soldiers, you know, not in terms of the, uh, the ideology of Hitler or any of that stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about what they were able to accomplish. It was, it was uh, some war machine. Did you feel like they were a formidable enemy? Oh yeah, we had a lot of respect for them. Um, particularly their, their, um, their general staff, their, their, uh, their officer staff, uh, their officers. Now we were facing, I think, uh, some tired soldiers or maybe some really green soldiers, the younger ones. 
But as I said, they had better tanks and they had better artillery than we had. And of course, they were in a defensive position occupying the high ground. So that was, you know, we had a lot of respect for them. When you looked at um, the early days, we were with Belvedere, even, um, did you, were you concerned about how much superiority they had? No, to be totally honest with you, I, 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 we all had a great deal of respect for the, the 88 uh, artillery piece. I can't tell you what a, you know, it's not one of these artillery shells that go, it's boom. I mean, it, the, the sound and the noise, there's no mistaking it. It's, it was so powerful, so fast, so and it could go right through a tank, one of our tanks. It was, it was a marvel of its day. Um, but uh, in terms of, did we think this enemy was better than we were up ahead of us? Or were you concerned that you were up against something that was pretty difficult? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. But we, we weren't cowed by it. We weren't thinking, you know, they're, they're better soldiers than we. I just, we all knew that they, they had really good artillery and good tanks, you know. The part of the problem with fighting in the, in the mountains is the tanks can't, couldn't go out in front of us. So when you get in flatland, then you can get, when you're fighting, not to take anything away from Iraq or Kuwait, um, but uh, the, the tanks and the heavy uh, uh, stuff can go out in front of you, which is helpful. Um, whereas in the mountains, uh, they're just sitting ducks if they do that. So, you know, we had to go ahead. They could provide fire support and mobile fire support for us, but they couldn't go out in front of us. I mean, I imagine a tank going up Belvedere. Yeah. I mean, come on. Well, I mean, you, you'd seen that they'd made other attempts to, you know, push the Germans back right where you guys mm -hmm. were going to. Mm -hmm. How did you think that it would be any different for you guys? Well, um, from my own perspective, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, and uh, B, uh, as it turned out, we probably would have had the same problem if they didn't take River Ridge, which is, of course, the whole story about Belvedere and River Ridge. Uh, I didn't know that until after the war. I mean, this is, it just shows you that your area of understanding about what's going on as a private, first class, <laughs> uh, in the war, the whole political aspect of it, the whole, now sure, when Roosevelt died and we got word of that, that was a little depressing. And when we heard about uh, the success of the, you know, the front in, in Normandy, the Western Front, uh, we were all happy about that. But that's all sort of, filtered down, and we saw that in Yank magazine. Uh, none of us had radios in the foxholes. Um, very little news came to us at all. All we knew is the next day you were going, you were fighting, you had to take the next objective, or you were relieving somebody, or being relieved and you were back, getting a little two, one or two days rest. The most uh, sad story about uh, the war that I was involved in was in when we were off the line in a rest area. And of course, they, I think they purposely tried to keep you busy, even though you were in a rest area. They didn't want you to be, uh, this is my theory, they didn't want you to be thinking too much uh, about uh, the next uh, thing that's going on or what you just went through. So they kept you active. Well, if you can imagine, we, we, the, the heavy weapons platoon, we're going to have uh, fire practice with their machine guns. Now, this kind of proves my point that, you know, you would think, you know, why do we, we're, why do we have to do this now? So they set this range up. Uh, so heavy weapons, machine guns, they fire, you know, 800 yards, 1,000 yards, things like that. So they set this up on a hillside here, and the targets were on a hillside over there, maybe 800 yards, 1,000 yards, I don't know. 
And I was uh, asked to take a pit detail down there. So uh, there was myself and uh, two other guys that I chose to go with me. And I almost took two guys that were twins. But I took one of them. Uh, don't ask me what I thought about it for a moment. Then I said, no, I'm going to take Now, why I did that, I don't know. And of course, they don't allow... Uh, people to be twins or five brothers in the same unit anymore. It's too, too rough if something happens, you know, on the family. Like the five boys that were killed on the ship in the Pacific. But anyway, uh, I went down and we, it's very makeshift uh, pits and we would raise the targets and we'd pull down the targets and radio back, you know, the hits and so on and so forth. Now, these are makeshift almost like a foxhole, if you will, and we're all sitting on the ground there. So um, after firing one time, now it's a ceasefire, I get out of the pit since I'm in charge of it, and I'm going to relay the hits that the two guys are going to tell me to the, to the line up front so the guys that are doing the firing can know what's, what's happening. Um, what we didn't know was whoever set up that range didn't allow for the trajectory of the bullets. And the bullets cut a high-tension wire. And it apparently fell and had been burning for quite some time and slowly burned across our phone wire. And um, I was fortunate because I was outside and I was not sitting on the ground, and I had rubber soles. And in order to speak into the phone, there was a wing nut on the phone. And you had to press it in order to talk, and you released it when you were going to listen. And I was talking. And it's like, as I said earlier, that life is suddenly a real tight, really fine thread. You take the sharpest razor blade and snip it, and that's the end of life. No, you know, nothing that's happened. All I remember was uh, seeing concentric rings coming at me and a huge hum. And then I could hear people talking, raise hip, raise hip. And I had this funny feeling that I was never, I couldn't move. I, I was going to be buried alive and no one knows that I'm okay. I thought I was okay. I didn't feel any pain or anything. And uh, I ended up about, oh, six or eight feet from where I was. Well, what happened was that that jolt of electricity, you know, made me go like this. And it, the, the, the contact was that wing nut. And, it, it, and I wasn't grounded. The two guys that were sitting on the sides were fried. Their, their dog tags burned a hole in their chest. And one of them was a twin, the one of the twins. Had I taken both of them, you know. So that was one of the sad experiences uh, uh, of the war. Um, but that was just an accident, you know. Can you, can you think of anything else that we haven't touched on that later on you'll be sorry that you hadn't mentioned? Oh, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you mean in terms of... Well, there's a lot of, you know, things I could tell you about the luck of the draw in terms of, I, I remember in, I think it was Tori IUC, these are just war stories now, but it proves the point about how lucky you are. Um, where there was a, an opening between buildings where we had to go through to move to the next block or whatever, and there was a burp gun that was spraying that opening. And um, we would try to time it so that we would miss the burp gun. And, and uh, so the guy in front of me went, he was okay. I went, he was okay. The guy behind me came, he was killed. Boom, just like that. So the point being that this guy is somewhere spraying that opening. 
and he knows. You know, it's just a matter of, of, of luck, as I said earlier. But there's jillions of stories like that. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the, the most... If you, if you, if you think about, uh, you know, why we were there and t thinking a broad picture after it was all over, the, and, 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 uh, and incidentally, I've thought about this many times over the years, and suddenly here it is in the last ridge in the book, that I ask myself, well, why were we there? I mean, the, the Italian mountains, who needed them? I mean, there's nothing. Were we going to go up into, into Germany through the Italian Alps? I think not. But we fought. The war began in North Africa first, and then all through Africa, up the boot. And then they had a southern uh, uh, front, and then they had a western front. And the main thrust, you know, across into Germany was on the Western Front. And then Patton was on the Southern uh, France thing and coming up that way. Why were we there? Well, all it was was to occupy 15, 16, whatever number of German divisions, you know. And there were certain times in the war, uh, one of the things that you have to remember as a, as a s tiny, tiny piece in this, war machine uh, called the U.S. military is that you are expendable. And I mentioned this little patrol that went down the face of Belvedere just to find out where this German fire is coming from and they fired into our squad. As I recall, uh, there was either two or three wounded, 